Of the 22 years that I've lived here, I've spent 14 in complete solitude. To live in the midst of Alaska's extreme lack of spirit, day and night, year after year, one is in desperate need of God's grace so as not to destroy oneself spiritually. One thing that drew me to Father Segundo Llorente was his friendliness, because it was anchored in his life. His kind was, was firm and profound. There was nothing superficial about him. Something that really stands out about him is his great spirit of sacrifice. It doesn't occur to just anyone to do what he did, to go to a country that isn't your own, in a continent that isn't your own, on an earth that seems more like heaven than earth. He was capable of this because of his extraordinary faith and generosity. When a person is truly convinced of his faith and spends time in prayer, it's very rare for that person to be sad or to make an error. He spent many hours before the Eucharist in the tabernacle in solitude, a little like Saint Damien of Malachi. He was a man of certainties, not of doubts. On a human level and a spiritual level, he was a real man. This man was a mystic. He was a great contemplative. Segundo was born on November 18, 1906, in Mancilla Mayor, Spain, a town in the province of Leon. He was a strong and intelligent boy, full of vitality and very outgoing. He was the eldest of 12 siblings. His parents, Luis Llorente and Moresta Villa, were farmers. When he was 13, he began his studies in the Diocesan Seminary of Leon. He soon felt called to join the Company of Jesus, and finally, in 1923, when he was 17, he began his novitiate in the Jesuit seminary of Carrion de los Condes. Years later, his brother Amando, also a Jesuit, would study at the same seminary. Amando taught and mentored Fidel Castro and later was the director of spiritual exercises for the ACU, a Christian life community in Miami. He passed away in April 2010. Following the teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola, Segundo's ultimate idea was magis, to do the most and the best in serving our Lord. This ideal led him to ask to be sent to Alaska, the most difficult destination for a missionary. After much insistence, when he finished his humanities studies in Salamanca in 1926 and philosophy in Granada in 1927, he was finally transferred to Oregon, USA, the Jesuit mission base in Alaska. He studied at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington to learn English. Afterward, he taught in Gonzaga College High School in the same city. During his stay in Spokane, he also began to write his first articles published in the magazine The Mission Century. In 1931, Segundo studied theology in Kansas. On June 1934, when he was 28 years old, he was ordained a priest and continued studying theology in Alma, California. Finally, in September of the following year, he traveled to his long-awaited mission in Alaska. His first destination was Akalurak, a missionary center with a school for boys and girls. He learned how to dog sled and studied the Eskimo language. But above all, he learned to understand and love the Eskimos. He had to explain the concept of God to people who had an extremely different psychology and way of thinking than Europeans. But just as the difficulty of the mission location was the reason Segundo chose Alaska, the challenge of the language and the abstract ideas of the Eskimos filled him and motivated him even more. In 1937, he was destined to Kotsoe in the Arctic Ocean, resisting terrible winter temperatures that reach 52 below zero Celsius. He carried out his pastoral work, speaking of God to old and young, baptizing babies, giving catechesis to children and teenagers, blessing marriages, attending the dying, celebrating the Eucharist, hearing confessions. Father Urente was more than a priest of the Eskimos. In his incessant rounds in that territory, he brought children to the boarding schools run by the missionaries when their parents couldn't take care of them. As he visited families, he took care of paperwork for the elderly who had a right to receive pension. For close to 40 years, he attended the Eskimos, journeying miles and miles from one shore to the other of the Yukon River. During long periods of time, he stayed in Akulurak, Bethel, 
Kotsoe, and Alakanuk. But his most famous writings are gathered in a book called Akulurakan Chronicles. In 1958, Alaska becomes the 49th state of the United States under the presidency of Eisenhower. I was 21 when I met him. I was still very young. And he was an example. He made an impact on me. There was something especially attractive about his personality. Father Urenti was a saint, but he manifested his sanctity in a very human way. He was a very dynamic person. When he gave spiritual exercises, he immersed us completely in meditation, in the knowledge of Christ, in our personal relationship with the Lord, because he lived all of this personally in the solitude of Alaska. But at the same time, he was very outgoing. He had a very joyful character. He didn't have an imposing spirituality. His spirituality was serious and profound, but attractive. That's Father Llorente. So how did he end up in Alaska? Well, when you want to go on a mission that doesn't belong to your province, you have to write the Father General. And that's exactly what Father Lorente did. He was an extraordinary young man, very fervent. So he thought to himself, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ as a missionary. Which is the most difficult mission? That's what he asked himself. And he was told the most difficult mission is Alaska. There were very few missionaries in Alaska, but that's where he went. He lived in almost complete solitude in Alaska. By solitude, I mean that even though he lived with the Eskimos, they didn't always understand each other perfectly, even though he spoke Eskimo. So in that solitude, he began a more intimate relationship with the Lord. In those long nights in Alaska, when it was extremely cold outside, he would go to the chapel and spend hours and hours before the tabernacle. He said, once in a while I got bored, but I said, Lord, where else could I want to be but here? Lord, I love you. Those are raptures of a soul that is deeply in love. That's how we can understand his life, like those of so many saints who fell in love with Christ and want to do whatever he wants. In addition to being a man of God, he had an extraordinary psychological and emotional stability. He couldn't have lived the life he lived in the environment in which he lived it without that stability, in every sense of the word, emotional, psychological, etc. At the same time, he was a man who enjoyed interaction and communication, yet he lived completely alone for years and years, very alone. Alone, but with the Lord right next to him in the tabernacle, with only a wall separating them. He was very bold. He sought to live what the Jesuits call mahis, which San Ignatius said was to choose whatever brings you closest to God, whatever gives the most glory to God, mahis. Don't settle for mediocrity. If I'm going to surrender my life, I want to surrender it to my last drop of blood. His experience as a missionary in Alaska was a path, journey, transformation, a type of test to his own spiritual and physical or corporal limitations. His physical limitations, Alaska. What does Alaska mean? It means some gratifications, but also a lot of difficulties, accidents. It meant martyrdom for some missionaries at a certain time. He was able to overcome all of these challenges. Alaska was the ideal environment to form a person like him. I don't think any other place in the world would have had the physical and geographical implications necessary to wake up in him the saint that he is even though he isn't yet publicly recognized as a saint. He really loved dogs, and his dogs were huge. He had the breed that pulls dog sleds, and he had his favorites. Often he would go across rivers with the dogs, and on one occasion, when he was returning from Kotzebue, I believe, all of a sudden the sled got stuck. The ice started to break, the sled fell into the ice, and the dogs were starting to slip. In that very moment, he was sure that he would die. 
He was stuck, and he was sure the crack in the ice would swallow him whole. He felt certain that he was going to die, so he commended himself to the Lord and said, Lord, whatever you want, I put myself in your hands. And in that moment, the dogs pulled a little more, and finally, they pulled him out of the ice. That's a story he tells, and it was the moment in which he saw death before his eyes. He felt completely trapped, and then the dogs pulled him out. It's true that I'm leaving behind the last remnants of my youth and my roundabouts, and I'm shortening my life with such difficult treatment. But Jesus died when he was only 33, and look at what he did. I'm already 35 and I haven't done anything. So it's about time for me to wake up from my lethargy, shake off the dust and do something. In addition to living in Alaska, he did personal retreats. Several times he did spiritual exercises alone on an island, bringing along only a shotgun to defend himself from the bears. And he said that when he went to the island, it was to make the old man die. But just a few days later, it started to resurrect. And with such strength, with such strength, he used to tell us. But he possessed that great capacity of silence and solitude. That's just one anecdote. But more than just an anecdote, it's an experience. But he lived so many adventures in the tundra, with the dogs, the wolves, and the dog sleds. Once he sunk into the ice and his stomach froze, but he didn't die. The Eskimos covered him with a bear pelt until he began to thaw out little by little, but he could have died there. And another time, he went to open a can of kerosene and it exploded. The entire house was destroyed, but he was left standing there with his hand up like this, but nothing happened to him. And he has thousands and thousands of stories like those, and he tells them in the books he wrote. Not too long ago, I reread On the Shores of the Yukon to remember and relive all of that, and it completely immerses you in what he lived there. When he arrived in Alaska, he immediately began to write for the magazine The Mission Century. And he continued to write his chronicles every month for 20 years. One day he needed wood to rebuild his cabin. To collect the wood, he had to cross the Yukon River in a boat alone. The river was flooding, so as he was going across the river, fighting against the current, all of a sudden his motor stopped. He realized that he was being pulled towards a waterfall. I'm going to die, he thought. My God, my God, have mercy on me. But the motor still wouldn't start. And then finally it hit him, and he said, Lord, it doesn't matter what happens to me. The only important thing is that you are, you exist. He accepted beforehand whatever God wanted. He was willing to die. He had almost 2,000 kilometers to go across in dog sled, and his pastoral work was carried out practically one by one. He took advantage of the winter to do pastoral work, because in the winter the Arctic Ocean freezes over, and there is less danger of falling through the ice with the dog sled. So he would go to each little town across almost 2,000 kilometers to visit the inhabitants one by one. More than once when he made it to the home of a particular family, he found that the entire family had died of scurvy. When he could, and when he arrived in time, he brought provisions. Those people lived a very rough life, but no one could do what he did without faith. Father Lorente loved the Eskimo people with an amazing intensity. He loved them until the end. But keep in mind that they didn't bathe. They didn't bathe because well, how are they going to bathe given their situation? Several times he caught lice and similar things because he spent time with them. Once you have truly begun a friendship with Jesus, it's easy to deepen and develop that friendship. He gives his all. I live right next to the tabernacle. My bed is separated from him by a mere partition. My relationship with Jesus Christ has somehow become so profound that I perceive death as a great liberation. I have a very impatient temperament, so I'm always impressed by the way he exercised the virtue of patience. The Eskimos have a completely different character and way of thinking. 
because they say now, and that now can mean in three days, or a week, or a few months. But for me, now means yesterday, or at the latest, this very moment. And I think that was important for his sanctification on a human level. He also mentioned how other Jesuits had difficulties in adapting to that Eskimo character because it is so tranquil and calm. He wrote a curious story about feeding the dogs. He kept the dogs far from the house because they barked so much. And he fed them smoked fish, naturally, because that's what they had, smoked and cured salmon. And every night, he went to feed them. So one night, he said to the boy who helped him, let's go feed the dogs. So they went to the pantry, took a sack of fish, and carried it hundreds of meters away from the town. And Father Yorenti thought to himself, these dogs aren't barking, maybe they already ate. And the boy didn't say a word. He accompanied Father Yorenti, but he didn't say a word. When they got to where the dogs were, Father Yorenti said, these dogs have already eaten. Did you feed them? The boy said, Yes. Why didn't you tell me? Because you didn't ask me. Imagine that with the temperament of a Spaniard. And I remember another story about the mailman. Father Urenti was in Anchorage, and he said to the mailman, go to Juno and see if there's any mail for me, keeping in mind that it takes seven days to get there in a dog sled. The mailman went to Juno, and two weeks later came back to the Jesuit mission. Father Urenti asked, do I have any mail? Yes, a lot. Where is it? In Juno. Why didn't you bring it? Because you didn't ask me to bring it. Father Urenti lived as a missionary amidst that mentality for 40 years. That impressed me a lot, because I would have killed him, the mailman and the boy, and others too. But Father Urenti probably would have killed them too, because he had the same temperament, but that's how he sanctified himself. You have a ton of mail, but it's in Juno. It's in Juno. One quality of his that I admired was that he was a man of certainty. Like John Paul II said, he didn't hesitate. Well, you know, maybe. But even in everyday life, he always gave an impression of certainties. What he said is good, what he says, in the gospel truth, literally. He didn't doubt, he didn't say, some people say, or you could think, or maybe. No, no. This is the way it is, and that's it. And that makes sense because in the Catholic Church there are many things that are certain that don't change, and that's what he believed. So he was a man of certainties, but he also had heart. He told us once that when his dad died, the dogs that he had there in Alaska understood the drama that Father Urenti was going through, and they consoled him. So he was a man with a lot of heart, too, very open to everyone. And this showed through in the meditations he gave. Because in reality, we appear to others just the way we are. We can't pretend to be good. If I'm an energetic person, am I going to pretend to be passive? No. I think that we can't hide the way we are. Even if we try to pretend to be someone else, others see us for who we are. So Father Urenti showed himself to be exactly who he was, a man of certainty and a lot of heart. Living in constant communication with God has been a great help for me. No matter where I am, it's as if I were in church. Neither the most blessed Virgin Mary nor the saints are capable of doing what a priest does every day. Christ could have given us his grace through other means, but in reality, he chose the intervention of priests, whom he clothes with his dignity to carry out the salvation of humanity. Among the promises of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, there is a very special promise for his priests, the grace of softening the most hardened hearts. He was a man who, when you spent time with him, made you feel reaffirmed. Keep in mind that I had consecrated myself to God more than a year before, but just by seeing him, he confirms you, what you're doing, what you're living, that you're going down a good path, security, certainty. I never had the sense that he complained or doubted anything, though he did suffer, 
it was obvious that he had gone through difficulties. He suffered, but not through vocational crises. So his certainty, his steadfastness, made an impact on me during spiritual exercises. Spiritual exercises always prompt an experience of God, so exercises with Father Llorente made a profound impression on me. Once when I was talking to him, the time came to say goodbye, and he said, well, that's it. In the kingdom of heaven, I hope our places are only a few meters apart. He has such a great sense of humor. Meters? In heaven we won't measure distances. But he said, hopefully our dwelling places won't be too far away. Two or three meters at the most. He had an incredible capacity to live constantly in the presence of God, in contact with Him. He said that it was almost natural for him. That's the way it is for a mystic. If you say that, it could confuse people who met him briefly. If you ask them, what was he like? They'll say he told jokes and made everyone laugh, and he had a great sense of humor. But beyond all that, he lived in profound union with God. That's what has always stood out for me about him. Because that's the key to being a saint, being very open to others, but with a strong union with God at the same time. That union with God often isn't apparent exteriorly, but it's the essence. When he came to Spain for the first time after so many years in Alaska, a journalist interviewed him. After a few questions, the journalist asked, Father Llorente, how do you want to die? He thought for a moment and said, How do I want to die? I want to die of love. And the journalist just looked at him. Father Llorente said, Write it down. I want to see it in tomorrow's newspaper. Father Llorente wants to die of love. Although his desire was to die in Alaska, he spent the last years of his life in the west of the United States working with Hispanics. He died of cancer on January 26, 1989 in Spokane, Washington, and was buried on January 30th in Des Moines, Idaho, in a cemetery near the Rocky Mountains. The cemetery is reserved for Native Americans and missionaries who served Native Americans for more than 20 years. And to think that he glorified God with that life, because those conditions would not have had the same effect on everyone. He spent 30 years there in Alaska, thinking with those people, eating with those people, living with those people, teaching those people. Become a saint like St. John Birchman or St. John the Baptist in that environment, you have to live purely by faith. He chose to go to Alaska knowing what he was in for and he stayed for 30 years. Now that's a life of authentic faith. To do that, you need the faith of a contemplative nun. She doesn't see the effects of her apostolate, but she lives it. That's the key. The true apostolate is transformation into Christ, and that transformation took place in Father Llorente. Without faith, no one could ever carry out such a momentous undertaking. Without faith, you don't leave home. Without faith, you don't endure 65 degrees Celsius below zero. Without faith, you don't leave behind your family, knowing that you may never see them again. That's not easy to do. Without faith, you don't expose yourself to scurvy, to martyrdom. You don't expose yourself to so many things. To do what he did, you need a lot of faith. He was in love with God. How could he not leave a mark? As far as generosity goes, it's hard to top Alaska. Tus ojos, tus em...